Thank you very much, Steve. And, uh, and let me reiterate your thanks to Dorothy for her leadership, second only to memorable figures such as Xi Jinping and uh, <laughs> President Trump, who's always the best of everything in organizing this event and in, uh, and in continuing to organize, uh, use the dynamic of this event to, to make the Belt and Road Initiative and the associated changes in, in global relationships part of UVA's consciousness and part of its academic mission. Uh, now, most of our talks today are going to be in the spirit of on the one hand and on the other. And my thanks to Steve are of the one, on the one hand and on the other because on the one hand, thank you very much for your very kind remarks about me. On the other, you gave so much good information about Belt and Road Initiative that that cuts into what I was planning to say. So uh, I, I'll have to figure out uh, what to skip now. Uh, and uh, because what I see as my purpose today is to provide a general framing of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is very difficult because the Belt and Road Initiative itself is pretty general. And it's also fairly new, and yet its prospects are all over the place, literally and figuratively. So, uh, so how how to how to put it in a framework? How to understand its its relationship to history, its relationship to to the current situation in the world is a serious problem. And therefore, what I'd like to do is address three questions. And the first one. My efforts have been undermined by Steve's excellent presentation. And the first one is, what is Belt and Road Initiative? The second question is, uh, why Belt and Road Initiative? How does it relate to uh, the contemporary world and to the, the prior history and the dynamics of Asia? And the third thing is, perspectives on Belt and Road. And here, I will try to do what Steve did to me and, and steal some points in advance from the speakers that will follow, uh, and, but, but tr by trying to present them in a framework of, of different types of perspectives and how they relate. So first of all, what is Belt and Road Initiative? Well, some of you may remember OBOR, One Belt, One Road, and that was the old name in 2013, 2014 uh, of the Belt and Road Initiative. And that was dropped in 2016 because the ones in the name were considered rather unfortunate considering how many different roads and how many different belts were actually involved. So Belt and Road Initiative is the new improved term. And I would say that it's an improved term for two reasons. One is dropping the ones. The second reason is using the word initiative because I think that initiative does a good job of describing what it is because initiative doesn't promise much except sort of pointing in a certain direction, certain kind of general dynamic. And Belt and Road Initiative should be seen as an umbrella, an umbrella brand, you might say, of a whole variety of, of, of uh, projects, and the, they have the overall purpose of making major improvements in the connectivity architecture of uh, developing countries. And as uh, Steve pointed out, there's many countries involved, 68 countries and counting. Uh, now, India is not involved. United States is not involved directly. Uh, and the reason that India is not involved is, is explicit that, um, that they're concerned about China's develop Belt and Road Initiatives in Pakistan. And what that does as far as providing China a direct access to the Western Indian Ocean and in general supporting uh, uh, Pakistan, which uh, lately been reconfirmed as a hostile power uh, to India. 
Uh, for the United States, I think the reason for the hesitation, as, as Steve indicated, is more complex. Uh, it's not that we oppose the purposes as stated, it's that we wonder what it does to our position in the world and what it does to China's position in the world. And we'll, I'll get to that at the, at the end, and then our next panel will be talking about that more particularly. Uh, okay, so now the Koreas, both of them have been positive toward the Belt and Road Initiative. Japan has been positive. Uh, so it's not that, uh, that, that it has divided the world, it's just that not everybody's a participant. Uh, so why, does, how, why has it been adopted? On the one hand, as, as Steve pointed out, it's a response to a widely acknowledged gap in infrastructure investment. And it's not just uh, a, a lack of money, it's the kind of infrastructure that does exist in many parts of the developing world. Much of it is old colonial uh, infrastructure. Old railroads basically designed to bring raw materials to mother countries, not to connect neighbors, not to, uh, uh, not uh, maybe in many cases, not using standard uh, railway gauges, uh, uh, generally uh, lagging behind the needs of the countries that they're in, which is hardly surprising after 60 to 100 years. Uh, another thing is the Generally, because of the colonial nature of, of a lot of that basic infrastructure, the basic infrastructure doesn't connect neighbors, it connects, con it connects colonies, former colonies, to mother countries, con countries, uh, developing countries, to a broader, to a global economy, you might say, but not to the neighboring economy. And that's a problem, in the, as we will see later on. So one of the things that Belt and Road Initiative does, besides adding money, is uh, enabling uh, these populations that have grown out, out, that have outgrown their internal infrastructure to develop new infrastructures, uh, and also to get beyond export processing enclaves as a mode of, de of economic development. <coughs> and China is a successful model at this itself. Infrastructure is not the primary reason for China's 40 years of progress, but it has been an important aspect. On the other hand, it is also useful for China because China has a surplus of capital and infrastructure building capacity. capacity. And the new infrastructure will enhance its integration into new regional and international markets. Uh, typically, the projects use Chinese money to hire Chinese companies to build things that improve the host country's access to China and to the rest of the world as well. So you might say this is not just win-win, it's win-win-win. And China might get its money back uh, from, the, from the projects. These are not gifts, they are to concessional loans usually. Uh, and if it doesn't get the money back, it might end up owning a lot of infrastructure around the world. And if it doesn't do that, it, it may face restructuring its investments or even making or forgiving investments, which it has done. All of these things have happened at one time or another. And also, last but not least, the Belt and Road Initiative has become an important part of Xi Jinping's prestige as well as that of China's. So, that's one way to look at it, and that's the way that we tend to look at it. But we should not neglect the fact that there's partner initiative and benefit involved in these Belt and Road projects. Despite China's leadership, Belt and Road Initiative is not a coordinated Chinese project that's just foisted on resentful or passive partners, or simply China offers the money and they say, well, why not? It's a... Uh, it's something, it facilitates local connectivity projects by providing loans, bargain contractors, and international cooperation. These projects that are financed are not necessarily directly related to China. For instance, the, the ring road in Addis Ababa, how does that lead to China? Uh, but it really helps traffic in Addis Ababa. Uh, the bridge here in Maputo, Mozambique, 
uh, this leads across the bay to an undeveloped part, uh, 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 southern part uh, of, the, of the city, uh, Katembe. But it doesn't lead to even a port. It doesn't lead to China. It leads to South Africa. Uh, but it does increase connectivity, and it does have other effects. So what are the pluses and minuses in general? Well, the pluses. First of all, in many cases, the Belt and Road Initiative has enabled long-desired projects to move forward. It's not that these projects were invented because of Belt and Road Initiative. In many cases, just as many of the cases in China's own development were things that had been thought of for 50 or 70 years beforehand. Uh, the projects uh, being engaged in, like building this bridge, are projects that people had been thinking of for a long, long time, but somehow it had never come together. The money, the resources, the expertise, the capability had never come together. Uh, a second plus is that the international framing of the Belt and Road Initiative encourages coordinated projects. It's particularly important in places where the colonial tradition was one of dividedness, where if you look at Southeast Asia, you had the French in French Indochina, you had the Dutch in Indonesia, you had the British in Burma, you had Thailand as independent. And so there was no reason for those, those colonies to work together. There was very little reason, there, and there was very little development of that infrastructure. The same is true in Africa. Uh, so this, in a new world, in a truly post-colonial world, uh, the question of how neighboring countries can coordinate and how regions can have the infrastructure to actually, to, to in a sense, actualize our regional uh, existence uh, is, is very important. And the third thing is something that I'll be talking about more in a minute, and that is that markets are changing that the whole structure of the global economy is changing. And in order to adjust to this change, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is something that is particularly appropriate. There are minuses. So the first minus is one that uh, Sri Lanka and Malaysia and other countries are beginning to, to realize, and that is the money has to be paid back. And not only, it's not just a question of having spent too much money or having invested in a project that's not a good idea. If you think about it, infrastructure investment is something it's hard to recoup uh, the, the cost of. Because if, if you build a bridge like this, there are people, you, you can charge a toll, but the toll has to be reasonable. And the main benefit will be the whole development of this area that used to be a two hour ferry ride uh, rather than a, a 10 minute bridge ride. So there's going to be all sorts of, of, of effects of this bridge that can't be, as a public economist would say, captured by the state. And for those of us who tend to be at the captured end of state things like this, we think that's a good idea. And it's probably a good idea for the countries. But still, you have that problem of the cost. China. The, the, the financing enables something, but has it enabled something that can be paid for later on? That's a question. Uh, the second disadvantage, the motivation for committing to a project uh, by the partner can be political or even private gain. So I, in an oppositional political system, somebody can make the headlines by getting, you know, by appearing in person to shake Xi Jinping's hand and commit to a major project and to have all this Chinese money coming to our country, you know. On the other hand, the opposition party will be pointing to the cost. And over time, with the disillusionment that the bridge is not free, the opposition party might try to reverse or whatever. And then when you get into private gain, corruption, things of that sort, uh, the, the possibility not only of, of backfiring, 
of fiscal backfiring for the project, but actually canceling or delaying or whatever is more likely. And that's what's happening in Malaysia now. Projects are not necessarily canceled, but they're being severely renegotiated right now. And uh, there's, there's attempts to bring down the cost, for instance, of the railroad in Malaysia. Uh, the uh, the third uh, minus is that the projects can be too far removed from the practical needs of the people. Uh, a bridge like this is a very nice thing. Uh, is it what the very poor country of Mozambique needs the most? Is is are there not other needs that could be more urgent? It's certainly a question worth asking. But does, when we raise that question, does that mean that any poor country has no right to do anything but feed itself? You know, can it have no projects that are signature projects or transformational projects of transformational development? Um, the fourth thing is that they can have, the projects can have social or environmental effects that weigh against its benefit. Not necessarily canceling the benefit because they're a different type of thing. Externalities, as the economists would call them. Uh, but certainly those are, those are problems within China and problems outside of China with the Belt and Road Initiative. So the mix of these pluses and minuses is different for every project and cannot be completely known in advance. So inevitably, some rain will fall under the Belt and Road Initiative umbrella. Uh, but the overall effect on global connectivity will be enormous, warts and all. Uh, and thus, our next question, why? Why is this important? Well, I'd give two basic reasons. One of them is contemporary. One of them is historical and dynamic. The first one is, uh, the contemporary one is the convergence of East of East and West in the current century. And our, our, our convergence of the West and the rest, I should say, of developing countries and developed countries in the current century. And the second one is the recentering of Asia on China. Okay. And this first one, the developing countries, uh, you could look at the 500 years from 1500 to this century as a time of divergence, of life chances, of productivity, of military hardware, obviously, uh, of uh, education, of, of health between the West and the rest. Uh, and it's really pretty spectacular. In 1820, uh, one third of world productivity was Western, two thirds was the rest. Uh, by 1978, still in 1978, two-thirds of world production was the West, one-third was the rest. The estimate is by 2030, oh, in 20, as we see here, in uh, 2008, I can figure this thing out. Ah, there it is. 2008, uh, the developing world surpassed the developed world in uh, overall production. It's estimated that uh, this is a, I, uh, 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 IMF statistics. Uh, in uh, in uh, 2023, it'll be up to 170%. <laughs> so the developing world in this century is converging rather than continuing the process of divergence that characterized the modern era. Uh, and that's an interesting fact in its own, but it has all sorts of implications for the structure of the world economy. And China is only a part of this challenge. It is not simply the, uh, the country that if you bracket China, everything disappears. If you bracket China, I got this data, I subtracted China from this data, and then, yes, 
developing country without China is not equal to developed world in, in 2008. But it does catch up in 2018. So take out China and still you have the developing world catching up to developed world in production in 2018. So what does this mean for the structure of the world economy? Uh, first of all, it means that South-South trade, developing country to developing country trade, is becoming more important. In fact, that's half of, of trade now. Uh, it means that there's a global an evolution of globalization away from the model of, of uh, countries like China producing manufactured goods because of low wages at low prices and then selling those manufactured goods to developed countries. That pattern, uh, McKinsey uh, just published a major study of, of world trading patterns this week, and they pointed out that only one-fifth of world trading patterns fits the model of, of, uh, of exploiting low-wage uh, uh, inputs into trade. The other four-fifths is not based on the wage differential between the, the partner countries. So why is this happening? Because there are more consumers in the developing world now, because the whole shift of the market is occurring. By 2030, uh, the developing world is likely to has, is estimated to have a half of the world's consumption. So they're going to be the market. And that is changing the, the internal pattern of trade, that trade is shifting from being product, uh, product to consumer trade to being, uh, uh, to, uh, to being uh, uh, trade in services and trade in complex packages of, of goods rather than in terms of, of uh, uh, the, the low-wage country making something and selling it uh, at, on the cheap to the high-wage country. So that whole pattern uh, is shifting. And as that pattern shifts, then uh, a, a different, this, this, this is a shift, it's not a transformation. If we look at the bottom line here, this is uh, per capita income. So you can look at this as a measure of, as a rough measure of wealth. And that has also risen for the developing world, but still it's at around one quarter and it, this is true for China too, one quarter of developed world in terms of per capita income. So the developing world is rising in terms of productivity, in terms of, its, of its, the massiveness of the economies, and in terms of its interaction with other countries and regional interaction. But that doesn't mean that it's replacing the US, Germany, Japan, et cetera, that it's catching up to their levels of personal wealth. So that preserves a, a kind of differentiation of the global economy in terms of developed and developing countries, but it shifts the balance of, of I don't want to call it power, because it's different kinds of power. It's demographic power versus wealth power between the United States and China to, make the, to, make, to take the obvious cases. Okay, so you have this, uh, uh, general situation, but they, these, these countries that are producing more now, these countries that have much bigger economies now, they're not going to be easily pushed around. And so uh, I would call this a multinodal world. Power still counts. Size still counts. Size counts more than it did before. Uh, but it's not a world where it's easy to see who's in charge. Are we in charge? I don't think so. Is China likely to become in charge? I don't think so. Something else is happening. It's not new Cold War. It's not something of, uh, it's, it's not the return of something else. It's something new, and that's what we have to adjust to. Okay. Well, part of what's new is the relationship of China 
to the rest of Asia, to the world in general, but to the rest of the world beyond Asia, it's more a question of China's rising presence rather than uh, the type of neighbor relationship that it has outside of, of uh, that it has inside of Asia. So the question here is, why is this centering around China occurring? Is the Belt and Road Initiative responsible for this? I would say, no, it's not responsible for this. It would happen without the Belt and Road Initiative as long as China keeps to the same basic policies of reform and openness and as long as those policies are reasonably successful. Okay? But Belt and Road Initiative fits into this pattern of recent... It, 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 uh, it's... It is the driver, it is the, it is the, uh, the trademark of this development uh, in the, at the present time. Uh, so what's involved in this? Why is it recentering? I mean, China was the center of East Asia before. Is this simply a return to the past? I'd say in a sense it is, but why is it returning to the past? What is true of the present that was true in the pre-modern era and was not true 1840 to 1980. I would say there are three factors. China's presence, its population, and its productivity. <coughs> that these things, China in, in the middle uh, was very important. China's greater concentration of East Asian population was very important. And both of these in the pre-modern era permitted a scale of productivity and a, and a qualitative upgrading of productivity that was important for its it, the orientation of East Asia around China. Uh, so was this like the present? No, the connectivity back in the pre-modern era was what I call thin connectivity because the government in China especially was interested in controlling that relationship with other countries. It wasn't interested in expansion that much. It was interested in, in uh, keeping its borders safe and peaceful and keeping its relationships with other countries safe and peaceful primarily. It made exceptions and it paid dearly for the exceptions that it made. Uh, so you had this thin connectivity characteristic of this period. Uh, best formulated in terms of the tributary system where countries showed their deference to China as central country, uh, but they also, China in return, did not interfere in the domestic politics of the neighbors. So that's this pattern of I'm okay, you're okay, and official contact was very much in control. Unofficial contact, of which there was plenty, uh, uh, it wasn't a matter for government concern unless it interfered and then government would try to control piracy or whatever. Then what happened? Uh, then you had, when the West came in, did China lose its population? Did it lose its presence? Did it lose its productivity? In a sense, it did because it was no longer so significant to be in the middle of Asia if the rest of Asia was being made part of a global system. Uh, French Indochina paid attention to France. It didn't pay attention to China anymore. China became weak and insignificant as a market for the rest of Asia. It was uh, non-existent as a market for colonial Asia. Uh, and it became a, uh, its population was poor it was not a consumer population, and it was also not a particularly, its production was survival production, so it didn't really attract attention beyond that. And China remained thin in its connectivity at a time when the sharp connectivity of the West was developing. And its productivity, Western productivity, mattered much more than Chinese productivity. So you had China's role in pre-modern era displaced by the West and this glo these global connections of the colonial era, of the imperial era, uh, in, the, uh, in the modern period. Then what happened? Well, it took a while. 
But in the current era, in the current era of reform and openness in China, you have a return of China, of the importance of China's presence. That's one of the things that recentering is involving. China matters more to other countries. Uh, you have a return of uh, China's population because it's a consumer consuming and producing population to the outside world as well as being a large population by itself. And you have its productivity, largest manufacturer producer in the world and largest economy in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. So what does this mean? Well, let me take the example of Southeast Asia because that's the one that I know best. If we look at China and Southeast Asia, China is a percentage of Southeast Asia. China was not insignificant in the 1980s. It was, its economy was as large as Southeast Asia. But notice the line here. Sometimes Southeast Asia, especially after the Tiananmen uh, period here, uh, Southeast Asia grew faster than China did. And in any case, uh, uh, it, it China was no larger as an aggregate than Southeast Asia was. By 2006, China has become twice the size of, of uh, the Chinese economy has become twice the size of Southeast Asia. By 2018, it's almost three times the size. And what difference does this make? Well, as a matter of comparison, U.S. GDP, this percentage of Latin America, is 271 percent. So, it, in general terms, the relation, the economic relationship between China and Southeast Asia is similar to the relationship between the United States and Latin America, and going more so. So that's, this is a sobering chart to see in Singapore. Okay, and it's not just these aggregates either. There's changes in the status of China. We look at China's per capita GDP. Back in the early 1980s, China's per capita, we were looking at ASEAN low-income low countries. This is uh, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos. I think that's it. Uh, and then ASEAN middle countries, uh, uh, Malaysia, think Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Thailand. Uh, I excluded Singapore and Brunei because of low, very small populations. Uh, but uh, if we look at this, in the early 1980s, the low-income countries of Southeast Asia were better off per capita than China. You don't have China finally passing the low-income countries of Southeast Asia until the 1990s. And then it takes off. The low-income countries of Southeast Asia are doing well, too, in part driven by Vietnam. Uh, but uh, still, China is doing much better. And in 2018, it reaches the average per capita income of the middle-income countries of Southeast Asia. What does this mean? Well, think about it. This affects China's relative economic status, you know. This affects... When Malaysia looks at China, it's not looking at uh, a country that has lots of people but not much money, you know, or lots of people, lots of money, but poverty, you know, not lots of people, lots of money, but not like us, okay, like us now. So the rise of China's status to upper middle income country is very important. A third thing that's important, that's somewhat more reassuring for China's neighbors, is that since 2014, one thing Xi Jinping declared other than Belt and Road Initiative was the new normal in China's growth. When the new normal in Chinese growth was moderate growth rather than, than ultra-high growth that had characterized the earlier period. So instead of 8 to 10 percent, 6 percent was okay. And if you compare the growth of China and Southeast Asian countries, China's growth, I, I dated this from 2014, so beginning of the new normal period, and China's growth is quite similar 
to the growth of those the, of the ASEAN low-income countries. But it's still a little, you know, it's still significantly better, but not overwhelmingly better than the ASEAN middle-income countries. And everybody's doing better. So that whole transformative thing that had happened in the previous 20 years before from 1994 to, uh, to 2014, that transformative period of the relationship between the two, that is over. It's China remains big. China is now equal status. Uh, but it's not going to leap forward to, uh, uh, to something uh, uh, to... Japanese per capita income or, you know, developed country uh, per capita income over 1.3 billion people. So this recentering of Asia creates a situation of asymmetry in Asia that is uh, a recreated situation of asymmetry because asymmetry had been a characteristic of, of East Asian international relationships originally. No place was quite like China in the pre-modern era. People could ignore China in the modern era. Now people cannot ignore China anymore, and there's no place quite like China again. But the countries China is dealing with are modern countries. They're countries that are engaged in the rest of the world. They're countries that are, in the case of Southeast Asia, are organized as regional groups, the ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So there's fundamental changes in the architecture of current day recentering compared to that older Jinsha uh, uh, tributary uh, type of relationship in the in the earlier age. So, how is Belt and Road Initiatives perceived? Well, for China. This is how it's perceived, especially officially. You know, uh, the community of common destiny, uh, the idea of everybody being together, you know, that's, that's, if you think Belt and Road Initiative, especially at the official level and especially at the beginnings, was something very positive for China's prestige, very positive for Xi Jinping's prestige, written into the Chinese party constitution. Uh, so very, you know, very much a part of how China sees its future in the world. Uh, since then, grumblings about spending so much money on foreigners when China itself needs more internal uh, spending, more welfare spending, etc. These types of questions have come up. For others, oops, for others, I would say there are opportunities, challenges, reorientation, and alternatives. The opportunities are obvious. Uh, go back to the bridge in Maputo. This is the bridge in Maputo uh, uh, with the foreground being Maputo's previously most famous uh, structure, which is its, its, uh, its railroad station. And... Uh, and undoubtedly, this bridge, one and a half times the length of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, $750 million, uh, you know, uh, th this will become a symbol for the city of Maputo and Mozambique. So this is a project that China made possible. This is a big project. When I talked to my friends in, in Maputo, one of them told me he grew up in a village uh, and his grandmother, who's still in that village, really loves China. Now, she hasn't seen the bridge, okay? She's living in this remote village. But the reason she really likes China is because until China came, there wasn't a road that her, her children could come to visit her on the weekends from the city. Uh, so there was no way she couldn't see the sun. And until China came, there wasn't a cheap mobile phone that she could talk to her grandchildren. And so to her, those types of changes, which are, you know, in, in, in 
the mentality of Mozambican is very much a part of their connection to China. Not just bridges like this uh, are important. But they're, and, and why do they like the bridge? Well, here's the ferry. Which would you rather do, cross the bridge or take the ferry? Okay. But there's plenty of roads that could have used repairing uh, instead of the bridge. So, uh, you know, was, it, was this a wise expenditure of money? And this is, you know, what I'm showing here about the bridge, it's true of, you know, probably nine out of ten projects under B Belt and Road Initiative. And it could have been spent on housing and other sort of personal welfare things uh, for people in Mozambique. Mozambique is one of the ten poorest countries in the world. You know, why does it need a big bridge? And there's other forms of transportation that might be replaced. Like the, this woman carrying Kinley. Oops, let's leave her on. Uh, so that's uh, the, the general situation. I think this illustrate, I think we could use the bridge to illustrate. Yes, it's an opportunity. Uh, uh, and it, but it does present challenges. It does raise questions of what the alternatives were. It also increases Mozambique's alternatives in terms of international relationships. So that's important. What about neighbors? Well, neighbors, uh, Vietnam, Southeast Asia in general, uh, Korea, they have been dealing with uh, a recentering toward China compared to the previous era uh, for the last 40 years. And so it's been a much more gradual process. Uh, but the neighbors, uh, they have to deal with a, a situation that is an opportunity and not a choice. They can't move elsewhere. As the foreign minister of Vietnam told me when Vietnam and China were fighting, uh, what alternative do we have to being next to China? You know, and uh, the answer was, you don't. You're there, you know. Uh, Hanoi is 100 miles from the Chinese border. Uh, so uh, for neighbors, the, um, there is this opportunity is also an implicit threat to their auto autonomy. So the question is, how do they protect their autonomy? How do they protect, you might call it their sovereignty at its most thin and sharp level, but their autonomy in general? How do they, how do they main, maintain their interests when they're in a relationship with a country with so many more resources and so many more alternatives. So these are the neighbor's problems. And recentering makes those problems more acute. For other developing countries, it becomes a resource and an alternative, but still China remains culturally remote. For the West, Uh, actually, I think we could use a little bit of infrastructure in the West in general. Uh, there's problems with German railroads. There's problems with Charlottesville railroads. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there, there are things that could be better than they are now, even in developed countries. And perhaps technology, I, I, I don't know if we need China's money, but the Chinese technology might be useful for that. But generally speaking, the West has a difficult problem of adjusting because it was the leader for that previous 500 years. It still has the advantages of wealth, experience, and habit uh, in, in this new age in which the West is no longer the center of the world. Uh, where the world doesn't have a center and there's different areas of power. Uh, for the United States, the problem is more serious. You have problems of, of, uh, of what I call the Allison trap, what, Alice, what Graham Allison calls the Thucydides trap, uh, which is that rising countries are always challenging uh, uh, hegemonic uh, incumbents, and the hegemonic incumbents fear that rise, and so war is practically inevitable. You know, some type of, of armed settling of that challenge is inevitable. Uh, and 
Allison doesn't treat it as inev that there's an inevitable inevitability of war between the United States and China, but he considers it quite likely as a clear as a present strategic danger in the world. And the first reason he gives is very good that accidents can happen. Uh, that as as countries are more suspicious of each other and as the rapidity of reactions in in uh, defense situations get shorter and shorter and with more and more consequences, why couldn't you have a war that no one wanted? I think that's something that has to be considered. At the most, I think underneath uh, uh, Allison's uh, uh, concerns are a general American and incumbent fear of the future, that China is rising faster than we are rising, though U.S. is not declining absolutely, it's declining proportionally. So how does the United States adjust to that? Uh, and the simple answer is it's not easy. You look at the British adjusting to the diminution of their empire, the French adjusting to the diminution of their empire. Uh, it's, it's, there's a hegemonic nostalgia. You know, there's a situation where you know, the past, the good old days are attractive, and how can we put a break on these future developments? How can we stop it? But my answer would be there's no way of stopping it. Therefore, the smartest thing to do, the most realistic thing to do, is to figure out what one's interests are in this new world and what one can do, what is feasible, not what is, uh, uh, you know, not trying to backtrack on history. So, I don't see this as a situation of a new Cold War. Remember the world that we talked about. That's not a world that separates easily into camps. Think of what Japan would lose to side with China. Think of what Japan would lose to side with the United States. In both cases, it's more than Japan had at risk, and Japan has more choice than it did in the late 40s. Uh, and that's true for every country. Why would they choose? Why would Vietnam choose to ally with China? Uh, it'd be very unlikely, I can guarantee you, as someone who visits Vietnam frequently, uh, why would it then choose to ally with the United States? Even less likely. Only if it were mortally threatened by China would Vietnam ally with the United States, and that's not the situation. So basically, one thing that prevents a Cold War is that there is no, uh, the, the possibility of camp formation is much more restricted. Another thing that prevents a Cold War is that China is the one that is leading this uh, economic development in the developing world. It's opening itself. <coughs> And our basic alternatives are not being more open than China, but being part of a general movement in the world and being an important part of that. Our other alternative is various varieties of containment, various varieties of shutting ourselves off, of, of decoupling, for instance, from the Chinese economy. Uh, two interesting things about that. A, is it possible and is it profitable, and I'd say Possibility is limited, and the profitability is is very is is zero. Uh, it's very costly to decouple. The second thing is, in the Cold War, which side built walls? Which side enclosed its group of countries? You know, which side made? Well, the name will give it away. The Warsaw Pact. Very different, and the the, uh, the 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 economic associations uh, of of the of the Cold War era that were closed, that did not engage in trade, that were suspicious of relations with an outside world. It was <laughs> it wasn't the United States. So are we going to are we going to start? Are, are we going to see ourselves as getting into a new Cold War? 
where were the Soviets? That doesn't seem like a good idea. And yet, over-militarization uh, is something that uh, I think is, is a serious concern for me as an American. Uh, uh, a sense of isolation, a sense of not adjust, of, of breaking against the changes that are occurring in the world that China's only the leading part of. Now, these are the types of things that, that, that worry me. Uh, but let me end on a happy note. Uh, my happy note is that I hope that the 21st century will be an era of sustainability rather than an era like the previous century of creative destruction. But sustainability is not static, and the resilience that sustainability requires is more likely in a world of have-somethings than in a world divided between haves and have-nots. I hope that the Belt and Road Initiative contributes to creating a general world of have-somethings. Thank you. Uh, is there anything anyone doesn't quite understand about the world? <laughs> no, seriously, let's have some discussion. Dale. presentation, Brantley, I was hoping you might be able to talk about what might happen if China's growth actually stalls rather than maintain 6%. There's many people, of course, who believe they're fixing the books already on, on the 6%, and it's probably closer to 45 5%. And I personally think the Belt Road Initiative is an attempt to, to keep the growth going in an ironically Leninistic overproduction under consumption problem that, they, that China has, uh -huh. where they are uh, producing a lot and they have huge pr production capability, but the consumption at home is not keeping pace, so they need markets abroad. But uh, be that as it may, what happens if the, the encroaching pessimism of the Xi Jinping regime about maintaining large growth actually starts to uh, become true in the sense that they, they peak at, say, 2 or 3% growth and feel that they're not keeping up. Is that the most dangerous scenario? I see. I personally think it is, but I'm just wondering what you think. Okay. Uh, it's a good question. And, uh, uh, of course, I don't know the future any more than you do. Uh, so uh, I can only give my guesses about it. But I would point out that that when you get into these, uh, you get s smaller growth figures uh, now from China. And I would be surprised if they didn't get an e even smaller, though going down to 2 and 3% uh, would surprise me. Uh, but if we, uh, instead of looking at the percentage of growth, we look at the material increment of the Chinese economy. That is, how much production rose from one year to the next. Uh, the production in, 19, in, in 2018, uh, it only rose 6%. Uh, no, no, this is 2017, only rose 6%. But that increment of its growth was equal to the entire Chinese economy in 1992. So it's a very important thing to remember that, that percentage growth is easy when you're small. Think of seven-year-olds, you know. Uh, but it's harder uh, when you have the larger and larger economy. So you, it, a decline in growth does not necessarily mean a decline in, in, in production or even in basic character of, of the economic situation. Uh, secondly, uh, you're absolutely right that China, has, China hasn't run out of internal infrastructure projects. 
but its capacity for, for handling infrastructure projects is considerably larger than the projects, than the, than the obvious projects it, it still has. So, and it's developed not just world class, but world leading technologies and, and construction groups and stuff like that for these types of projects. You know, look at the high-speed rail. China has more than half of the high-speed rail in the world now. Uh, so if you want a high-speed rail system and you're in Indonesia, you're tempted by Japan and its reputation for quality, but if you want it cheap, you know, and they work in China, at least ever since the Winjo accident, uh, but uh, uh, so, so why not buy Chinese? And, and certainly that, that capacity has led to that. But you're... But, you, you elide China's cons consumption growth with this over relative overcapacity uh, in, in uh, capital, uh, capital capabilities. Uh, personal consumption has grown fast, is one of the faster growing parts of the Chinese economy. And that's something that's been emphasized for the last 10 years or so. So you have an increase in Chinese consumption uh, uh, and that's likely to continue. And at one fifth of the world's population, that's very important for the for the general stability and expectations of the Chinese economy. What would happen? Like I said, I don't know the future. So, so what? Let's say if China has a uh, a severe uh, reduction in in growth or some other you know, whatever problem leads to this one to two percent type of growth. Remember, it's not single product export dependent or you know, there's there's many aspects of of chinese growth that that uh tend to produce stable patterns of growth both external and internal okay so i don't think this is likely but if it did happen uh something that can easily be forgotten is that there's other types of of uh of claims to legitimacy for governments than success um, you might remember uh, President George W. Bush when he was running for his second term. You know, his claim wasn't that he was successful. His claim was that we needed a strong commander in chief. And so one could easily imagine a recalibration of, of Chinese politics in a we've got a crisis, only the party can handle this crisis type of mentality. So, uh, uh, It'd be, it'd be a mistake to assume that a, a, uh, a limitation of growth uh, would inevitably make everybody look toward some more efficient system, in part because where is that more efficient system? Yes. Thank you so much for that wonderful question, uh, Brantley. This was a, a delightful presentation, and I learned a ton. Um, now, what I wanted to do is build on this provocation that you kind of laid out at the end of the talk yep. about the the um, the case in which there would be a new Cold War, but the U.S. would be the one building walls and you know increasingly militarizing. Because um, a lot of times we do talk about this question of like what happens if there's destabilization of the Chinese economy, or you know, uh, we, we focus on China as being the unstable actor in this in this system. So I was wondering, since you since you brought it up, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you if you would care to expand on that, or kind of what how, what kind of strategic challenges you see in terms of how the U.S. is is presenting itself in relation to China and the Belt and Road. Oh, very good. Uh, yes, and I have to say that that and. I, giving talks in various places like Ethiopia, Mozambique, Vietnam, Taiwan, Cuba, uh, and everybody's interested in what's the tension between U.S. and China going to do to them and how they should relate to it. So this is a big question around the world. And, uh, uh, and when I'm in China talking about this, I point out that, uh, you know, the... Trump's presidency, on the one hand, has very much complicated uh, U.S.-China relations and made it a lot less predictable. On the other hand, Trump is also unpredictable in all of his other relationships, and 
therefore, China, if it remains stable in it, its presentation and things like it, BRI are, are good for that, then China can have a relative benefit. Somewhat similar to the benefit that it had in 2008 from having a stable economy at the time that the United States economy started this, uh, this uh, global financial crisis. And so China's economic prestige went up and up and up. It went up so fast it got scary to other countries, okay? It wasn't the only thing, but it was part of the, the, the general uh, China anxiety of the post-2008 period. Well, now, is this an opportunity for China to have a, a, a leap forward in political prestige? And I would say it is quite possible because, and again, you're looking at these two. It's, U.S. is going like this and China is staying relatively stable and giving you money, you know, and supporting your projects and talking about a uh, community of common destiny instead of America first, you know. These are types of things that, that on the the outside of, of the bilateral relationship would help. On the inside of the bilateral relationship, it's really important to remember that there is no, there's no resource that we're fighting over with China. You know, there's no zero sum that if they win, we lose, and if we win, they lose. Uh, even if you look at things like energy in the long term, uh, uh, both the U.S. and China have money will have energy. If, if, there, if energy prices started skyrocketing, it's places like Mozambique. Not, not Mozambique because they just discovered liquefied gas, or, or no, natural gas offshore. But uh, Ethiopia, which doesn't have any natural gas to my knowledge, you know, they will suffer because they are, they're going to be chasing higher prices with resources that are not going to increase that fast. So it's that, that change, the question of change of status is very important. Uh, but it's not something that drives us to inevitable war. That's what I have, that's my problem with Graham Allison. I think he gives a mentality of, that's very common in the United States. It, you might say started with Sam Huntington and the clash of civilizations. You know, that, that uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's dragons out there, you know, and uh, and the dragons are getting bigger, uh, and uh, that may be true. But there's a whole zoo out there, and we're and there's no bars, you know, and that's a place you have to live, and it would be good to adjust to that rather than you know just uh, dig a hole and jump in. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, oh, okay. please join me in thanking Dr. Womack.